Since 1952, the American Psychiatric Association has published the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM, as a guideline for the classification and diagnosis of mental health issues. The DSM, according to the APA itself, is the standard classification of mental disorders used by mental health professionals in the United States and contains a listing of diagnostic criteria for every psychiatric disorder recognized by the U.S. healthcare system. Earlier this year, the APA published the DSM-5, the fifth major revision of the manual. The DSM-5 was created in order to assist clinicians in being able to better recognize uh, mental disorders in patients and establish a diagnosis and then provide them with treatment. So to the extent that DSM-5 is an improvement over its predecessor and re reflects the uh, current state of our scientific knowledge, then it will help doctors provide better care and will improve the quality of life and the health of patients. And that's really the main goal. The DSM, in all its iterations, and, and particularly in this iteration, DSM-5, it doesn't jump ahead of where scientific research is. It, it's at the cusp or it lags just behind to be conservative and not you know, overstate evidence that has not been firmly established. It reflects the state of our science, but doesn't tell you where science is going to go in the future. Commonly referred to as the Psychiatric Diagnostic Bible, the guide has always generated controversy. How are disorders diagnosed? What criteria are used to establish disorders in the first place? Are the categories subjective? Do they reflect cultural biases? These questions are not unique to the DSM. They have plagued psychiatry since its earliest days. But the DSM, as the base guideline for the use of clinical psychiatrists across America for the past half century, is the place where these philosophical issues are decided in concrete terms. Some of the DSM's most strident critics dispute the very name of the guide itself, pointing out that it is not statistical and that the term diagnosis is itself misleading. And it's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So that tells you something right away. The statistical part makes it sound statistical, scientific. Actually, there's no statistics in the diagnostic criteria whatsoever. There's a little bit of statistics in the discussion. Mm -hmm. But it really isn't a statistical manual. There's no t-tests or chi-squares or anything. And then it's the diagnostic manual. So as soon as you call it the diagnostic manual, you're clearly saying it's medical, and these are diagnoses, meaning illnesses. But then when you read the book, it says they're disorders, not diseases. So there's kind of a double speak, kind of having it both ways at the same time. Okay. It's clearly psychiatrists or MDs, they're doctors, they diagnose mental illnesses, but they're not actually technically diseases. Right. And it says in the manual that there's uh, no laboratory test for any of the diagnoses. And it's specifically in the criteria for schizophrenia, it repeats that. There's no laboratory test of any kind. Wow. So clearly they are not in fact established specific medical diseases. We would have loved to have science brought us to the point where we know that this gene uh, or this toxin or this trauma you know, produces this disorder and you can make the diagnosis by this blood test or this kind of x-ray or this type of electroencephalographic procedure. Um, and God willing, that day will be coming fairly soon. This question of terminology is not mere quibbling over semantics. If the label of medical diagnosis is extended to the field of psychiatry, even in the absence of any objective or external criteria for producing that diagnosis, then the medical prognosis of prescription medicine seems justified, perhaps even inevitable. Again, far from an academic debate, the question of when and how to justify pharmaceutical treatment for mental health issues is one with real-world implications. Implications that impact the bottom line of the trillion-dollar pharmaceutical industry. Criticisms of the DSM and questions of Big Pharma's influence over the process of creating the manual are not happening at the fringes of medical debate either. Perhaps surprisingly, one of the leading critics of the DSM-5 was the chair of the task force for the previous edition of the guide, the DSM-4. Our society is already uh, immersed in pill popping. One out of every five adults takes medication every day. Six percent of the population is addicted to psychotropic medications. The um, sales of antipsychotics 
are $18 billion a year, amongst the highest of all uh, classes of drugs. The sales of antidepressants, $12 billion a year. Stimulants, $7 billion a year. I think that from the point of view of clinicians, it's important to be cautious in your diagnoses. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't make fancy diagnoses after a brief initial contact with patients. Concerns over Big Pharma's influence on the creation of the DSM are not trivial. In 2012, a study led by University of Massachusetts Boston researcher Lisa Cosgrove noted that 69% of the DSM-5 task force members had ties to the pharmaceutical industry, including paid work as consultants and spokespersons for drug manufacturers. On certain panels, the conflict of interest was even more profound. 83% of the members of the panel working on mood disorders had pharmaceutical industry ties, and 100% every single member of the sleep disorder panel had ties to the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture the medications used to treat these disorders or to companies that service the pharmaceutical industry. Even the chair of the DSM-5 task force himself is not above these accusations. Prior to chairing the task force, he worked as a consultant for Novartis, Pfizer, Eli Lilly, Johnson & Johnson, and a host of other pharmaceutical-related companies and organizations. The APA has responded to criticism of task force member ties to Big Pharma by issuing disclosure statements listing each member's ties to drug manufacturers and other commercial groups, and an agreement limiting their income from industry sources to $10,000 in any calendar year in which they worked on the DSM. Despite these assurances, Many point to the depth of these pharmaceutical industry ties as a fundamental cause for concern over the DSM process in particular, and the direction of psychiatry as a whole. One such critic is Dr. Bruce Levine, a practicing clinical psychologist and a vocal critic of the DSM and its methods. Well, I think we should definitely address the drug issue because this seems to be the real heart of the the issue and what's driving these uh, these different revisions and the expansion of the number of people who are included in them, and uh, and there are a lot of different uh, different aspects to this. But uh, obviously, you mentioned, for example, the uh, overprescription of antipsychotics, which is now an eighteen billion dollar a year industry, one of the most prescribed class of drugs. Um, antidepressants, I believe, another twelve billion dollars a year. Um, just a- incredible amounts of money, obviously, are being pumped into this and are facilitated by these DSMs. Uh, let's talk about the drug issue and uh, the, the influence of the drug manufacturers over the creation of this uh, so-called Bible. It's just huge. I mean, uh, like I said, that about 69% of the people who are in the DSM-5 uh, task force had ties to uh, drug companies. And the I think when folks hear these numbers, sometimes they, they get lost with you know million, billion, to kind of give folks a sense of how huge these antipsychotics are. Just one antipsychotic is now this one called Abilify, which you might be seeing, on, at least in America, here we see on t- television being advertised regularly as a, that you, get, you, you could use for psychosis, you could use for depression as sort of like an antidepressant chaser, take it along with your Prozac. Well, this thing, Abilify, this is an antipsychotic, um, is going to is targeted to is on pace to grow six billion dollars this year. So in the first quarter of 2013, it had already become the largest grossing of all drugs, not just psychiatric drugs. Seroquel, another antipsychotic, hit six billion dollars in 2011. And so these are gigantic amounts of money. I mean, to kind of give people a sense of how big that kind of money is, Facebook only grossed five billion dollars last year. Yahoo only grossed five billion dollars this year. So one antipsychotic drug okay, is grossing that much money. Well, how how is that grossing it? Well, it's not being given just for kids with, uh, you know, it's just not being given for people who have psychoses. It's being given to control populations. I talked about kids, huge, huge billions of dollars are being made off of just controlling kids, but also old people in nursing homes. That's a lot of the places that they're being given. Also, folks in prison, um, that's where a lot of these drugs are being used. So any population out there of vulnerable people who you, who authorities got pretty much complete control over who they want to they want to most easily uh, control um, they're, they're getting control with these antipsychotic drugs and that's why um, they're, they're making so much money off of them in the end what is at stake is not merely the utility of the DSM as a diagnostic guideline but the credibility of the psychiatric profession as a whole as critics like dr. Francis and others have argued in the relentless drive to expand the number and the scope of mental disorders with the attended increase in potential customers it brings for the drug manufacturers, more and more people are being driven from the ranks of the normal into the care of psychiatrists. This diverts attention from the extreme cases of individuals most in need of mental health care 
and makes impersonal interactions dictated by DSM guidelines and ending with knee-jerk drug prescriptions all the more likely. For many, the direction of psychiatry has to be diverted from its current course before the very human condition itself is pathologized and medicated out of existence. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.